Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I uh, hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here, uh, focused on uh, the global economy and economic governance, and um, delighted to welcome you all here to CSIS on a Monday afternoon. Uh, also delighted to have our online viewers. We always have a good uh, group as we stream everything we do publicly here uh, at CSIS. Um, thank you to the uh, Government of Japan for sponsoring this event. It's part of a series that we call Strategic Japan, which looks at a range of issues, political security, economic issues in the U.S.-Japan relationship, and we appreciate the support. It um, allows us to do what we, what we do. A couple of administrative things. First, um, as usual, please turn off your phones, if you could, or put them on mute. Uh, if there's any kind of incident, which is unlikely, uh, we can obviously follow me. First of all, I'm your warden, I guess. Um, we can go down the front, if appropriate, or there are exits back here to the alley, and we rally behind us at uh, National Geographic if there were any kind of incident. Um, the run of show, we're going to have, we're going to uh, plow right through the, the program today. Um, I'm about to introduce our first keynote speaker. Then we're going to have a panel for about 75 minutes. Uh, we're not going to take a break. We're going to go straight then into our closing um, remarks or sort of conversation with um, Ambassador Robert Holliman. So, um, so it's a, a, we're going to be efficient and get through everything uh, here this afternoon. So I think that is all I have to do in terms of introductions. Um, let me just say the Simon Chair has uh, taken a, a great interest in this question of digital governance. Um, I mean, we've been interested in governance for a long time, how the global economy uh, is run and the institutions and rules and norms that, uh, that, that uh, guide uh, the international economy. Um, the digital aspect of this has been obviously something that we've been uh, increasingly focused on over time. There are many others at CSIS and of course around town who are interested in uh, digital related questions, uh, but we think there's still a, a kind of an, um, still a very um, nascent uh, conversation underway about uh, the digital governance uh, uh, story, the data in particular, the way that data is going to be uh, collected, stored, uh, used, uh, traded. And uh, this is a huge issue, and it's something that we're uh, learning about, and we're trying to um, uh, understand what the issues are, and particularly the issues around you know, how you establish a, an appropriate regime of privacy for consumers, uh, while also allowing data to flow uh, as it needs to for business and for economic efficiency reasons. So that uh, understanding that balance is what this is really about. And we were particularly struck uh, in January, and relating to the Japan dimension of this, uh, that Prime Minister Abe, in his remarks at Davos, as I think most people here know, uh, made a pretty um, interesting presentation that sort of surprised people because instead of focusing on uh, things that uh, you might have expected a Japanese Prime Minister to focus on traditionally, he actually zeroed in on this question of data governance and digital governance, and he actually said uh, that he wants, in particular, uh, the G20 summit, which he's going to be hosting in June in Japan, to uh, be, quote, long remembered as the summit that started worldwide data governance. Well, that may be a bit of a hyperbole, uh, but, but started a conversation about a, a, an approach to data governance um, that uh, he wants the Osaka G20 summit to be remembered for. So that caught our attention, um, and we thought that doing an event um, on this topic right now to kind of shape, uh, to, to look at what that means and what it might mean uh, would be very timely. So that's, uh, that's why we're here uh, today, at least I hope that's why you're here as well. That's what we're planning to talk about today with a great group of uh, uh, experts and speakers and uh, people who have uh, given a lot of thought to this, including our keynote uh, speaker, Representative uh, Susan Del Bene, who is, uh, represents Washington's first congressional district. She's been in uh, Congress since 2012. Uh, she currently serves on the House Ways and Means Committee, which, as you know, among other things, has a trade subcommittee, which she's also on, and so that's of, uh, of great direct relevance. Uh, she's also, um, even if she weren't a congressperson, she would be probably here uh, to offer her expertise because she worked at uh, Microsoft for, for a number of years. Uh, she was the CEO and president of Nimble Technology, a business software company, so she has real uh, business expertise um, on uh, the topics that we're talking about today. And I think that perspective, that combination of experience and perspective is going to be really uh, valuable to us. So with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Congresswoman Del Benning to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Um, thank you, Matt, for that introduction and to CSIS for inviting me. Um, it is true that before coming to Congress, I spent my career working in technology for many years. Um, so I'm really excited to be here to talk about a subject that I really have a great personal interest in. Uh, my home state of Washington is a great example of how the rules governing global commerce have become, have changed so much and have become increasingly complex. Um, back in 1791, the Lady Washington became the first American vessel to make landfall in Japan, carrying sea otter pelts from the Pacific Northwest. And then a little over 200 years later at Microsoft, um, I helped launch Windows 95, which I guess really dates me right there, um, at the very early stages of the digital era. And today, more than 3.8 billion people are online. And digital flows have a larger impact on global GDP growth than trade and traditional goods. But unfortunately, in many cases, our laws have not kept pace with this rapid change. Um, we have in Congress, we haven't been able to pass an update to the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, that went into force in 1986. A lot has changed in technology since 1986. And while updating our domestic laws needs to be a top priority, um, a top priority in Congress, it is equally important that we reassert ourselves on the world stage and make sure we're helping shape global digital governance. Um, too often, this administration has viewed global engagement and trade as a zero-sum game instead of a means to achieve broader foreign policy goals that advance American values and ideals, including a free and open internet. Um, previous American presidents have recognized the importance of trade, um, with President Kennedy stating that trade has quote, become more and more an expression of America's free world leadership, a symbol of America's aim to encourage free nations to grow together. And almost 50 years later, in his first trip to Asia, President Obama stated, quote, in an interconnected world, power does not need to be a zero-sum game, and nations need for not fear the success of another. As an Asia-Pacific nation, the United States expects to be involved in the discussions that shape the future of this region. So as a country, we need to get back to this vision of global engagement and realize that if we don't take leadership um, and we don't play an important role in promoting the rules-based international order, um, including a global digital framework, we risk ceding this opportunity to others and in many cases to our competitors. And there's strong evidence that this is already happening. As everyone here knows, President Xi has been extremely active on the world stage. In a three-hour address to the Communist Party Congress um, in late 2017, he said that the Chinese model of growth had given a new choice to developing countries and said, it is time for us to take center stage in the world and make a greater contribution to humankind. So China is aggressively working to export its governance model to other countries. And in the digital space, that is manifested in its digital Silk Road. In early January, Bloomberg published an article that clearly illustrated the extent to which China is exporting their digital infrastructure. One of the most striking examples cited in the article is what's happening in Zambia, where the Minister for Transport and Communications has threatened to ban Facebook and Google, and where the government is considering a draft cyber law that would create an agency with the power to determine whether information published online threatens national security, which would be punishable by jail time. This sounds pretty similar to some of the cyber laws that China has considered or adopted in the past. In Africa, the United States has undertaken relatively modest initiatives in the past, like the Obama-era Power Africa initiative, but the scale of these initiatives is nowhere close to that of the Chinese. In Asia, the United States has been more assertive in the past through initiatives like the development of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And while the Trump administration withdrew from the agreement, and many in the US continue to argue the merits of the deal, it does include important provisions that promote a free and open internet, ensure the free flow of data across borders, prevent data localization, 
and bars forced technology transfers. And while it's encouraging that, that other TPP countries move forward with the now CTP, or CPTPP, um, its provisions aren't as meaningful without the US at the center of it to provide a counterbalance to China. In the absence of strong US leadership in emerging economies in Africa and Asia, China will continue to extend its reach and put us at a strategic and economic disadvantage. While China tends to get the most attention in this conversation, one of the most significant developments in digital governments, digital governance has been the EU's General Data Privacy Regulation, or what we all call GDPR. Since GDPR has gone into effect, the Europeans have not been shy about their desire to have GDPR set the global standard for data protection. At the end of January, the European Commission announced that it adopted an adequacy decision on Japan, creating the world's largest area of safe data flow. While I applaud the EU for taking the necessary steps to address these important issues, I do have some concerns with GDPR. Specifically, my biggest concern is the effect it can have on small businesses and on entrepreneurs. Big companies can hire armies of lawyers and technocrats to help ensure compliance, but small businesses and startups who've really thrived um, with the internet, um, many who are in my district and across our country, they don't have those resources. Finally, we have recently seen other troubling developments in several other countries from strict data localization measures in India to Indonesia's recent move to amend its harmonized tariff schedule to add software and other digital projects, products transmitted electronically. So the natural question now is how do we move forward? These days in Congress, we spend too much time relitigating old arguments and reacting to past events instead of focusing on the future. Um, as Winston Churchill said um, once upon a time, if we open a quarrel between the present and the past, we shall be in danger of losing the future. That being said, there are certain basic steps we need to take that address past problems and establish a framework to address future challenges. So first, when discussing di digital governance, I believe that an important first step is to pass a strong consumer privacy bill. That's why I introduced legislation last Congress that would change the way consumers' personal and private information is collected. This legislation would help people by ensuring that all users are presented with their company's privacy policies in plain, clear English. Um, because as we know, when a screen pops up on a website with a lot of confusing language, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot of confusing language, it's easier for consumers to just click OK without really understanding what they're agreeing to. The bill would also require companies to allow users to opt in before companies can use consumers' most sensitive private information in ways the public may not expect. Those companies must disclose whom they plan on sharing that information with and for what purposes that information will be used. They will have to undergo privacy audits by a neutral third party on an annual basis. And there will be consequences for companies that don't comply. The Federal Trade Commission would have rulemaking and enforcement authority. And if the FTC declines to take action against bad actors, my bill would empower state's attorneys general to pursue those not in compliance with the legislation. Um, this will help keep the US um, and help bring it into harmony with GDPR while avoiding the parts of that regulation that could stifle innovation and potentially put the US startup community at a competitive disadvantage. And from a global perspective, it will also provide our trading partners with an alternative privacy framework to GDPR. Um, another important step we can take is actively supporting the e-commerce negotiations at the WTO. I was pleased last month that 76 countries agreed to start negotiations to put in place global rules on e-commerce. However, I'm worried that the inclusion of China in these talks could open the door to obstruction and a weakened agreement since their current digital regime is so radically different from our own. I realize some countries want to include China to achieve critical mass in those negotiations, and some people believe we need to include China to show that the WTO can still produce results. 
And these are valid points, but addressing these issues and creating a cohesive digital governance structure is really of the utmost importance. And if China can be a constructive partner in those discussions, they definitely should participate. But um, I think history has shown us that that may be unlikely. Instead, we should be working with like-minded countries to, bring, uh, to create a high standard agreement and then work to bring other countries into the fold. And finally, we need to recognize that in order to truly address digital governance issues, we need to go beyond rules and standards. We need to be more active in providing technical assistance and trade capacity building to help developing countries build a digital infrastructure that is more in line with our vision, not necessarily China's. But at the moment, we aren't doing this. We don't even have a functioning export-import bank to help finance the purchase of American technology. Um, if we're uh, able to secure an ambitious high standard e-commerce agreement at the WTO, we have to be willing to provide developing countries with the resources they need to eventually join the agreement. This is in both our strategic and our economic interests. So while no doubt we have some serious challenges that need to be addressed, I believe that we're up to the task. I'm encouraged that Prime Minister Abe has indicated that a framework for global data governance will be a main focus of Japan's chairmanship of the G20 this year. Um, but the US cannot sit on the sidelines in this effort. In the coming months, I look forward to continuing to work with people in this room to help create a high standard framework to govern the digital economy. Um, thanks again for having me here and I look forward to our discussion and questions. So yeah. thank you, um, Congresswoman Delvenny. That was fantastic. That was um, both right on point in terms of the issues that we're uh, grappling with here, uh, the questions of privacy, questions of, um, of um, data flow and uh, the, some of the restrictions on data flow that, that uh, are of concern, the different international approaches, and uh, it couldn't have been more on point. If I could ask a couple of questions of you and then um, just to kick this off and then I'll invite the audience to come in, so uh, prepare for your uh, for your questions, but um, let me ask a domestic question and then an international one. Uh, the domestic one is you've uh, mentioned your legislation that you introduced mm -hmm. last Congress. First of all, you're reintroducing it this Yeah, Congress we're working on uh, you know, continuing to get feedback from folks and we'll be reintroducing um, legislation. Great, and do you, do you really, do you think that the consensus is forming sufficiently to be able to get something like that through? I mean, there seem to be some pretty serious rifts uh, between consumer groups and and business groups uh, within business, they're different, very different views uh, between the federal and state level um, regulators or the, the people who have a, a stake in federal or state level regulation. There seem to be some really serious uh, differences of opinion. Do you think this is uh, something that can be brought together in this Congress? I think, it, I think we can and I think we need to. I think it's incredibly important. We have, uh, Right now we have a vacuum because we've not addressed many issues. I talked about changes to the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, um, some very simple things there that have been hard to get through Congress legislation like um, email privacy, just to make sure that we have a warrant standard for digital information. Um, that has been hard. I think part of the challenge is that people don't understand these issues. These are complicated issues. A lot of folks don't have background in um, technology and understand them well. So. Um, so that's part of the job for me um, and, and others to make sure we're educating members of Congress on how important these issues are um, and moving forward legislation, having those debates and moving forward legislation. When I put together the legislation I discussed um, that I introduced last Congress, we worked with um, people who are consumer advocates, um, worked with, uh, with businesses, both large businesses, small businesses and others to really put together something that um, could meet the variety of needs that, that are out there. Um, and I think that's you know, gonna continue to be the work that we do. We've seen some proposals come from the Senate as well. So- do you, um, Is this a bipartisan? Uh, it absolutely uh, should be. You know, privacy, move. some of the privacy bills that we put forward before, I always say it kind of lights the board up if you've ever been in the House of Representatives and watched as people vote. Um, 
um, privacy legislation isn't really um, does isn't something that comes and falls in a partisan camp. It's interesting how um, folks can view it differently. So it absolutely has the opportunity to be bipartisan legislation. So your idea would be to get this legislation uh, through to establish a sort of a, a strong foundation of, of uh, privacy, sort of sensible privacy approach. And then you, you also, you know, your, your remarks and your, you know, your background in business would also suggest, you know, that that can then be the basis for, um, for a, uh, an approach to business use of data that is consistent with, you know, freer trade and um, freer flows of data um, around the world. Is that something that you see actively working on domestically, something that we need legislation or other approaches to to promote? Well, I think privacy really helps start that. But really, when we look at trade and digital trade in particular, um, these issues are going to be established one way or the other. If we don't take action domestically, we're going to end up coming to um, see their rules that we have to live by if, if our business community is going to operate internationally. And so I think it is important that we are engaged and involved in this issue and are showing leadership on these issues. Uh, so it's a combination of domestic policy, but also what we do um, with respect to trade. Do, do, you, do you worry that there's a possibility of the world kind of dividing into three or four different internets and different approaches to digital governance with a sort of US-based model, a Chinese model, a European model, maybe a fourth one? Uh, somewhere is, is that a real risk and and uh, well that's it, it is a risk I think we um, you know I spoke about data localization efforts um, the architecture of the internet was about having a free and open internet was about the movement of data if we start seeing more data localization that will make it very difficult for that same architecture to work and people not have the same um, the same technologies and the same access that they may have today um, and more and more, we will have you know, different ways, different information controls that are out there. Um, it'll be harder and harder for folks to know what to expect when they are looking for information. And it'll be harder for businesses who are working internationally to be able to, um, whether it's on the e-commerce side or um, as service providers or even just um, news organizations providing information, it'll be very difficult um, if you have to have a different type of product or service for many different countries. Um, and that's part of what we should collectively try to work to avoid. And, and is this something on which, and the last question, then I'll bring others in, um, on which you know, there's a sort of clear stake in our winning this as opposed to maybe some sort of um, compromise outcome in which you know, everybody's approach you know, has some weight and, and we sort of get everybody around a table and agree on a, on a common approach, or do we really need to kind of have the US approach to this win um, for our interests? Well, I think, I mean, one, the much of the innovation, um, the the development you know, of the internet was, and the kind of services and products that have come out of that, much of that innovation has taken place right here in the United States. Um, we have so many businesses that are dependent on that, that architecture of the internet and have been incredibly successful because there's been demand around the world. Um, and we've seen many smaller companies now start to have opportunity to compete globally because of that. So yes, we have from a from a you know economic standpoint, we would have a lot to lose if that changes, just because that's a, such a strong part and big part of our economy. And we talk about technology companies as if it's just technology companies, but I would say a lot of the digital infrastructure is foundational for many different industries. And so I, we shouldn't just say this would have an impact on certain technology companies. I'd argue that it impacts every pretty company, much every sector. Every company a, and, um, and clearly that impacts us, but would impact others um, globally as well. Great, okay. Well, um, I could hog the whole rest of the time here, but we have about 15 minutes. So, uh, the Congresswoman's kindly agreed to give us until 2.45. So if there are questions from the audience, please raise your hand. There are microphones. Wait for those and, uh, and please do ask, identify yourself and then ask a question. There's a gentleman here in the second row, please. Embassy. Oh, there we oh, go. I'm Dyson with the Dutch Embassy. Uh, I think you make a fair point when it comes to uh, small businesses being more uh, victimized basically by the GDPR, uh, whereas big companies can just hire a big law firm and defend themselves. So I was wondering how do you plan on like 
um, coming up for these smaller companies in your proposed bill without setting the bar just low with them for big, big firms? Well, um, part of what I think that we've looked at doing is one, um, making sure we kind of have the body that is going to be setting the rules. The, uh, in my legislation, I talk about the FTC doing that, um, being able to set that standard, making sure that we have audits regularly so businesses are able to provide those, and those audits would be with a neutral third party so that there is someone checking regularly and that in a business can then go back and say, hey, I've, I've been audited and I, I am going through the process and complying. Um, but uh, we need to make sure that consumers have a voice and in our legislation, um, I've talked about state's attorneys general being able to, um, to enforce um, on behalf of their states. And so we, it would be a combination of FTC, state's attorneys general being involved and the auditing process to make sure that we um, are businesses are complying. And um, for small businesses, making sure that we have very clear rules of the road is gonna be very important because it, if we have many different pieces of legislation out there, it's very hard to comply with different ones. And that's part of the challenge I think that folks are looking at now. How do I compete internationally if I'm going to have many different requirements? I think that means that a lot of smaller businesses won't be able to enter different markets as a result. Okay, um, I think there's a, a woman uh, back there. Yep, right there. Right now, keep coming. Yes, this woman here. Yep, thanks. Sure. I'll stand. Okay, sure. Hi. Hi. Okay, Melissa Eady from the Embassy of Japan. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I just had a quick question. In regards to you saying about um, privacy on the consumer level, domestically and internationally, I was wondering that you said that businesses would collect information. Obviously there would be a screen that would say in plain simplified English and or the language that they choose that they are going to basically agree to move forward with that. However, what about customers or consumers that opt out of that and they wanna keep their privacy private? Are there gonna be any underlying like cookies that are still gonna collect the information that they don't really know they're gonna collect? You know what I mean? So that's why you have the constant like Facebook ads, that's why you have the constant like um, other social media ads that you get because you like looked up a certain information, et cetera. So a, a core you. tenant of, of um, my legislation is opt in, that someone opts in. And so until you opt in, your information is not going to be used until you are actually presented with what information is gonna be used and how it's going to be used. Now, an important part, I think, of all these pieces of legislation is de defining what um, your personal or private information is. Um, there is information about us that is publicly available, and so we need to make sure that um, we are protecting that private, sensitive information, um, whereas someone might be able to find out um, something about me, especially about me as a public official, um, without me having to actually provide it. So some of that is available right now just in the public realm. But um, making sure we have that clear definition of what that private information is, and then um, consumers would opt in and understanding that when they opt in, they are given information about how that information is going to be used or how it would be distributed so that they are able to make a, you know, a, a, a clear decision about how that information is going to be used. And that's what we mean when we talk about you know, clear, um, plain English. But there would still be an incentive for people to opt in because they would be given full knowledge of what was going to be done with their data. Because there's a risk if you do opt in that people will say, well, I'm not gonna opt in, you know, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna participate. And then that could really be disruptive to like small and, and businesses. And that's a choice I think that individuals will make. And I think that's, the, and people, different people may make different decisions. And yes, there may be trade-offs in terms of the benefit I get if I do opt in. Um, and that will be an individual's decision to make that. Okay, I have a, a, a follow-up, but I'll, I'll let this gentleman in the back there, this side, right there, yep, in the white shirt. Okay, join us from the French Embassy. Um, do you think um, uh, tax, taxation and uh, especially raising taxes on um, global tech companies should be part of this discussion on uh, uh, the regulation of um, um, the internet, um, the, the global regulation on the internet and, uh, and technologies? 
Is that something under consideration in France? <laughs> <laughs> um, it may be. Uh, taxation. Well, I think, you know, first of all, um, you know, tax vol when we're setting up the, when we're talking about privacy, things like that, I think we need to have a conversation about privacy, about cross-border data flows, um, how information will, will flow in the architecture of the internet. I think those are important conversations. I do think that tax is a separate discussion um, because, and I think as we look at, you know, there's even been talks of any types of tariffs or duties on, um, on digital trade um, and something, again, that if that becomes part of the process will definitely impede some of the, and, and have an impact on business activity in a lot of areas and maybe people won't enter markets in that way. Um, but uh, I think that the tax discussion, and I'm also on the tax subcommittee here um, in on the Ways and Means Committee, um, I do think that we probably haven't had as much of a discussion as people need to do in terms of impact of the way the e-commerce e and other things have changed the way the world works. Um, one big issue in the United States for a while was collecting sales taxes on, on, um, on e-commerce transactions and this idea of physical presence. So there's still a b lot of conversation that needs to happen there, but I think they are important discussions, but separate discussions. The, 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 no, the uh, principle of no taxation of digital trade was embedded in TPP and I believe extended in CPTPP. Uh, and it's also in the USMCA agreement as well, I believe, if I'm not speaking out of school. I think it's in the US-Canada-Mexico yep. agreement as well. Um, and so that uh, is a standard that the US has you know, tried to support. Absol absolutely, um, and I think you're gonna see an impact if if there are um, if there are fees or tariffs or taxes put on there, that will definitely impede a lot of digital trade. Right. Okay. Other questions? Uh, this gentleman here, and then we'll go back there. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Lay, and I'm an emerging technology analyst. And I wanted to know your opinion that knowing the ability of digital governance is depending on the ability to access data and the Chinese government and corporate near unrela uh, unregulated ability to collect data on its citizens, do you think that the EU and the United States focus on protecting consumer data from being shared is detrimental? Instead, we should focus on the uh, regulation of how that data is used by collectors? Well, I think um, protecting data is important, and I think um, making sure that we are protecting how it's used is also important. I guess I'm not quite sure that those are necessarily in opposition to each other. Um, you know, when we talk about um, even data breaches that we've seen, et cetera, how to make sure that people are living up to a bar in terms of how information is protected. You may have agreed to have your credit card information been given to a business for a transaction, but you didn't agree for it to be released. Um, we look at data breach, so making sure that there are high standards for how information is secured and protected um, is critically important too. So I think we need to do both. Okay, that gentleman's been patient over there, and I'll maybe let one other question after this, if you have one. Hi, uh, Brett Fortin with Inside US Trade. You mentioned China's inclusion in the e-commerce talks in Geneva that are set to formally launch this month. Um, is there a timeline for the completion of those talks, and how could the U.S. move forward if it decides that China has been uh, obstructing the talks, or if its ambition is not um, up to snuff? Um, you know, that is my concern: is making sure that we have uh, we have a high standard and that we are able to move quickly on that high standard, and then bring other countries um, in. So. The, when the, the announcement came about a month ago, um, China kind of came in at the end and was part of that. And that my concern has just been that that would potentially slow down that process or lead to a, a weaker agreement um, because it is important that we move quickly um, and, and that we have a high bar that when we set that high standard. Um, we have 76 countries who are participating, so it's a lot of folks to bring together in any case. But, um, but I am concerned about it being slowed down or ha us having a very low bar for agreement. Does that suggest maybe we should be pushing, um, you know, these plurilaterals pushing out from um, USMCA, from T, if we, well, 
we're probably not going back to TPP anytime soon, but, um, but if we um, uh, use some of these other plurilateral mechanisms, if we can't get China to agree, is that something that we should be pursuing actively um, by working with three or four or 10 countries as opposed to 76 to try to advance? Well, I think that was, you know, it, it, obviously if you have less, you're able to potentially come to a high agreement, a high standards agreement that you can roll out. And so that um, might have, definitely would make it easier. Right. And, um, but we should still try the, we, the, the multilateral but or the, I, the broader. I think multilateral is fine. It's just we've got to make sure that folks are active participants and are trying to create that high standard, not trying to weaken it or slow or it down. down. Okay, there was a lady over there. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I'm Ann Kokos from the University of Virginia. And my question is about how, we, how the US presents this alternative model of um, data governance when we see the European model emerging and the, the European and Japanese models emerging, the Chinese model emerging. But um, as someone who looks at China, there, there's a lot of attraction to a lot of countries to this kind of cyber sovereignty model of gathering data, using it for social control, social, for social governance, as well as for the protection and development of local industries. And it seems that at this point the U.S. model is less attractive um, for export. Um, so I was wondering, how do you, how do you contend with that um, in cases like we mentioned with Zambia or like we see in Vietnam? Um, how do we present this as a, as a viable and appealing global option? Um, it, that, that's a great question. I think one, we have to have clear standards ourselves and clear, clear laws in place. Um, part of the challenge I think we have is telling others what we don't like without being clear what we do think the, the right um, standards should be. And um, so that's one big reason I'm very concerned that we're behind. We, we talk in general about what standards should be, but we haven't really been formal in putting a lot of that in place. Clearly there are things that have been in place in trade agreements, but even our own domestic policy, we are very far behind. Um, we, and from, from basic things like warrant standard on privacy being you know, probably the thing that should be the easiest in many cases to, um, to kind of what's going to be a government's model around things like artificial intelligence and other areas, which we have talked about only at a high level, but really haven't started walking down that path of exactly what that might look like. So, um, so we have a lot of work to do there, but I think that's, we have to set that standard and then it, I think it will um, provide a, a easier guidance for us when we're working with other countries to talk about why we, are, why we came up with the standard we did and why it's so important that others um, follow that standard. I also liked your, you know, your ideas and your remarks about capacity building and, um, and, and uh, technical assistance yeah. and so forth. I think that's something we do you know, relatively well in the US and, and if we put more money into it, because it does cost money, uh, and more uh, um, people, because uh, that's another problem. We have very few you know, foreign co commercial officers or even USAID people in the field, but if they could help with that, I think that's a, that, that was a very constructive yeah. idea in there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before, before I ask you to join me in, in um, uh, thanking Congresswoman Del Bene, let me just say, as I mentioned, we are not going to take a break. Uh, right after this, we're gonna go right to the panel. That's gonna take about 90 seconds of rearranging the stage, so be patient, stay where you are. Uh, we will move right into the panel. My colleague Stephanie Siegel will run that. Uh, but now you can uh, join me in thanking Congresswoman Delbeni for a terrific Thank presentation. Thank you so much.
Are we, uh, we're live, can folks hear me? Great. Yep. I just, I have this image of, uh, of an Indy 500 pit stop and I'm wondering if anybody is actually timing <laughs> how long it takes for us to do the, the stage changes here. Um, but I think we did okay, 90 seconds or so. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Stephanie Siegel. I'm a senior fellow here at CSIS and deputy director of the Simon Chair in Political Economy. Um, it's great to see so many people here. It's great to see the sort of interest um, that we're seeing um, at CSIS across Washington and globally <laughs> in, the, in the topic of, of digital governance. Um, the, the name of today's event, um, starting off with the comments from Congresswoman Del Bene and now continuing on with our panel, is Digital Governance in the Pursuit of Technological Leadership. Um, so explicit in that title is the link between digital governance, technological leadership. Um, implicit in the title is the link between digital governance, technological leadership, and economic leadership. And it's really this understanding that the rules that are being set now are really setting the stage for the rules of the 21st century global economy and beyond. Um, that, as Matt said, is the reason that my program in political economy is so focused on this issue. There are a number of programs here at CSIS that are focused on this issue. Um, but that really is um, the, the grand sense of it, the, the vying for economic leadership and who's really setting the rules for that leadership. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just set a little bit more of a um, context here with a quote um, from one of our panelists. I'm curious to see if the panelists can self-identify after I, <laughs> I read the quote, but it was on a, a writing that one of our panelists did. Um, the quote is that the overarching question is how to develop a governance framework that provides meaningful protection while also leveraging the economic benefits of data-driven innovation. Any recognition on that? Um, so that is a quote. It's actually a quote taken from an Indian expert committee. Um, it's a group that was convened by the Indian government as they are going through the very same question of coming up with their framework for digital governance. Um, thank you, Chandra, for, uh, <laughs> for using that in your paper. But it was really quite illuminating for me as I, as I read that. And we're going to hear a number of different regional perspectives on this issue. But India is often mentioned as one of the big players in this space, a key country that is, um, that is also developing its digital governance framework, often in a direction that is not necessarily in line with the United States or Japan or even Europe in some, in some areas, and yet the fundamental question that they're asking themselves is exactly the one that we and others are also asking about the link between protection and also fostering an environment for economic leadership. Um, so before turning to the panelists for the real expertise here, um, I think it might be helpful just to clarify what we mean by digital governance. Um, certainly, it's data governance, and we heard a lot about that um, in Congressman Del Bene's comments. Um, those are things like the rules behind how data is collected, um, who's responsible for the protection of that data, under what conditions can that data be shared, and folks will recognize the policy names behind that, things like data localization, um, policies that govern the cross-border flow of data. Um, certainly, there's data governance issues and then closely related to that are privacy policy issues, and the Congresswoman also addressed that. Those two things are very closely linked and under the heading of digital governance. Um, there are also other issues and some of the questions just a few minutes ago got at that. Things like the treatment of um, software source code, um, the treatment of algorithms under different data privacy regimes, um, things like digital taxation, um, even legal liability related to digital um, content and digital platforms. These are all things that are under that heading of digital governance. So we have plenty to discuss here. Um, we could build a couple days long event, I think, over the number of, of potential issues that we could discuss. Um, we've got about 65 minutes, so we'll, we'll do our best. But we've got a great panel here of experts gathered. Um, the idea, as I mentioned earlier, was to have folks that have certain regional perspectives to really see how these issues look across the world. So I've asked everyone to give a few minutes of their kind of opening comments, and then we'll just have a discussion here amongst us on the panel, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions from all of you um, to hear what's on your mind um, before wrapping up and then going into our closing comments with uh, Ambassador Holliman. 
So just um, brief introductions. I think you have everyone's full bio, so I'll just give very brief introductions. Um, but first, we have uh, immediately to my left, um, Naoki Otasan, who's founder of News Stories Limited. Um, he's the former special advisor to the minister at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications for the government of Japan. Um, next to Otasan, we have Paul Triulo. He is the practice head in geotechnology at Eurasia Group. Um, he's going to talk to us about emerging market issues with some focus on China, I believe. Um, next to Paul, we have Peter Fatelnig, who is the Minister Counselor for Digital Economy Policy at the Delegation of the European Union to the United States. And then finally, at the far left, we have Chandra Watson. She is Director of Policy at BSA, the Software Alliance, and a specialist in privacy policy in particular. So um, thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, Otasan, if you'll mm -hmm. kick us off, yep. that'd be great. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Naoki Otani from Japan. And, uh, Today, based on my experience and expertise, which I built through working for the Boston Consulting Group for almost for, for two decades, where I led the technology group for Asia Pacific, and uh, as you mentioned, serving as special advisor to the Minister of ICT and the Japanese government, um, I'd like to share a couple of ideas, uh, including, um, like uh, Derivan mentioned, why the Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister of Japan, proposed a free flow of data at Davos. And also, I'd like to talk a bit about how Japan is uniquely positioned in terms of their harmonizing different privacy rules across regions. And also, um, I'd like to touch on a bit about the emerging idea of data portability. The data portability is uh, partly defined by GDPR, but uh, it's um, being developed in a bit different way in Japan. So let me start with the, uh, um, the, the a proposal made by Shinzo Abe in January. So I'd like to ask a quick question to you. So why some countries, including China, and uh, also some Western countries are going for data localization, which is opposing to the idea of free flow of data? So there are some reasons, but I commonly mentioned one is a concern about the data security and the privacy. And the reason why the, the Shinzo Abe made the, his uh, proposal a doubles was that the, he, his idea is ensured that the free flow of data and the data security and privacy can go hand in hand. So that's why he termed his proposal as data free flow with trust. So behind that, there are um, two important moves to which Japan has been heavily involved. One is the, what the uh, Derivan mentioned, the development of WTO. So back in 2017, the new initiative was launched to create new rules for e-commerce. And as Derivan mentioned, over 70 countries, including China and the US, are now pushing for new rules. And this year in January, Japan and uh, Australia and Singapore made a, a joint statement uh, to uh, welcome the WTO's uh, e-commerce negotiations. That's one move. And the other move I'd like to draw your attention is that Japan has been working hard to harmonize um, the different privacy rules. The back in 2014, Japan joined um, the APIC, the cross-border privacy rules, the CBPOs, and after that, Japan started um, to have a discussion with the European Commission on privacy rules. And it took some years, but uh, finally, in January, as you know, uh, as you know uh, Jap uh, EU and Japan um, uh, declared the mutual adequacy recognition on privacy rules. So, and then today I learned that the, uh, the, the, the very serious discussion is going on to uh, create federal the privacy bills uh, in the United States. So I admit that there's a, some way to go, but uh, I believe uh, Japan can play a very unique role uh, in terms of harmonizing the different privacy and the security rules across regions. So, um, and I also, uh, since I'm a business person, I, I, I'm very interested in the, what kind of opportunities uh, is emerging around data portability. So data portability has uh, two different uh, aspects. 
One is, of course, to protect consumer rights. But also, it will, uh, if providing the, the some pro, uh, proper rules, uh, it will create a new opportunity uh, to invite uh, uh, more companies to utilize data. So um, if you like, I'd like to touch on what's really happening in Japan around data portability. Thank you. That's, that's great. Thank you for those comments. And you said packed a lot into just a few <laughs> minutes there, in particular on the harmonization front, which I think is something mm -hmm. when we talk about what is setting kind of the global standard, the feasibility of actually yep. setting a global standard, that topic of harmonization is, is central to that. So thank yep. you. Um, Paul, you're up. OK. So um, <laughs> I think there's already been a lot of discussion about China here. So I think I'll, I'll just try to give a little sense of where China may be on data governance. And then we can talk about some of the other countries that are looking to the China model, as some people just talk about. It. So I think it's important to, to step back and say, you know, how, where, where is China on this, on this spectrum? And have to keep in mind that it took the EU how many years to come up with the GDPR, right? It was a long process, very long process. So China really began this process, you could argue, in around the 2016 time frame with the passage of the, of the cybersecurity law. So I think um, coming out of that were, were a couple of important pieces of legislation. One was or implementing regulations. One was around cross-border data flows uh, and data localization. So these issues the Chinese began to really study. My sense is that they miss underestimated how difficult this was going to be, okay? So mm -hmm. in the last two years, for example, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about how to do critical things like define um, key pieces of that legislation, like who, who is uh, a critical information infrastructure operator, uh, and you know, who's going to be actually res uh, held responsible for some of the provisions in the law. And then there's a very general provision in the law about data localization, um, which again hasn't really been implemented and hasn't really been uh, enforced yet. And so uh, if you look at where China is, it's really uh, in the process of, of, of uh, an early, early in the process of, of, uh, of trying to come up with a, a data governance regime. So last year really was a huge focus in China on data governance. I was in China five or six times last year, and every time there was a conference or a meeting about data governance. And the Chinese are still looking to things like the GDPR, looking at the FTC. I just was up last night reading an article um, about uh, some of the consent provisions, for example, around in GDPR and how that differs from the U.S. approach. And then uh, China has, uh, in the last year, uh, come up with a new personal information security uh, specification, which is a non-binding uh, specification, a standard that is going to be used to, for, to evaluate companies and how they do th deal with things like consent, um, but it's non-binding. So, and then there's a lot of talk in China also, for example, about uh, things like the CBPR and, and uh, potentially the adequacy agreement. Of course, now that there's a lot of, you get a lot of chuckles in the room when you hear about China being judged adequate on this. But I think the point is that they're still grappling with um, how to come up with a data governance regime. They don't, they're, they're, there's not a long history of data privacy uh, and concern about data privacy as there is in the EU. And, so, and there's not a lot of, a lot of lawyers that have, are steeped in issues like data privacy. And so I think uh, within China, there's a huge dialogue and debate going on. And over the last year, as I mentioned, there's been this big focus on, um, on, on privacy because there's a huge, for example, market in China for people's data. So I think 85% of respondents in a recent FT survey said that they're data had been sold uh, somewhere online uh, and, and had been you know, out there. There's a robust black market. So the authorities in China right now are, are focusing on, for example, crack, cracking down on, uh, on sort of this black market in personal data. Uh, so that, that's, 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 uh, that's one factor. Now I think what's happened since China has begun this, this long process of developing its data governance regime is a whole lot of other things have happened. So there's been a lot of, of course, concern around things like the social credit system, which we can discuss. Um, there's also, uh, since 2016, now we're in the AI and 5G era, for example. So I was in Barcelona last week and of course this, these issues were, were front and center in every discussion around 5G and AI. Um, and then the other, fa I think, really important fact you have is that Chinese companies like Alibaba and Tencent are going global. And so now their approach to data and handling of data are coming under a lot of scrutiny. And so and particularly in the EU, this is going to become a big issue this year. Um, and even on things, and companies like Huawei, which is a, was a big topic of the, of the Barcelona discussion, there was a big meeting uh, with some of the leading EU data privacy uh, protection uh, uh, boards. Uh, about whether, for example, the Chinese national intelligence law, which mandates 
uh, that companies and individuals comply with, with uh, in terms of intelligence work with the Chinese government, does that, uh, does that apply extraterritorially? And so there, you know, these kinds of issues are obviously very important to discuss uh, now because, uh, in part because Chinese companies are, are big global players, whether it's in uh, equipment supply for 5G, whether it's uh, platform players like Alibaba, uh, and, or whether it's artificial intelligence uh, ac across the board, so I think um, you know the 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 China model really of of sort of. Uh, you know, of data governance hasn't really, I, I would argue, hasn't really solidified. It's not nearly as well developed, of course, as the GDPR. But 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 Chinese authorities are certainly looking uh, at, at, at both examples. They sort of see the the GDPR as the, as the gold standard, I think, and then they see the U.S. approach with the FTC and the vol a more voluntary approach is also not desirable. So they're trying to find that middle ground, um, that sort of data governance with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and that's definitely a work in progress right now. Uh, and I think, I think it's difficult to say where that will come out. But clearly, the Chinese government does not want China to be a big black hole in the, in the global data governance uh, 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 regime, uh, whatever it does emerge. And so they'll be looking for things like adequacy uh, uh, and, and for, th for areas where China can, can step up. Um, but there's still a lot of problems, of course. You know, there's no data protection authority in China, et cetera. So there are a lot of issues that are at play right now. And I think um, now this is, a fantastic time to have this, have this, this kind of a discussion, um, but I think you really have to dive down into the details uh, of each of each country's uh, approach, and then you know countries like India are also, as, as Stephanie mentioned, are also uh, trying to figure out their way forward on on, on on data governance and looking to the EU, for example, um, on things like GDPR. So let me stop there, and I'm happy to dive deeper into any of those issues I've raised. Great, yeah. There's there's a lot. Yeah, as with Otisan, I'm thinking we absolutely need to have a day-long event where we can have each of you um, chair your own panel <laughs> to do uh, to do uh, do service to each of these topics. But um, thank you, Paul. Um, Peter, the European perspective. Well, I, I think in this conversation, one way to approach it is if if we look at today's problems and then try to find solutions to today's problems. Now that is fine. Data breaches are a big issue these days, and companies are massively investing, as this costs them a lot of money, and probably even more importantly, costs them consumer or user trust. Now that's one way of looking at it, fixing the past. And as Delbena has said, Representative Delbena, that I think maybe we should be looking forward. And I would like to spend my few minutes a bit in the, on, on the future conversation. Um, it's sort of, we, we have to ask ourselves sort of what what sort of rules of the road do we want for this data economy in the five to 10 years from now? Because that's about the time frame it takes to get anything in a regulatory environment off the ground. That will be a time when, as Paul has said, AI will be here much more than it is today. That will be a time when 5G has been rolled out, when some of the promises of the billions of devices of the Internet of Things will, will be true by that point in time. So what are the rules of the road for that environment? We're not talking about uh, uh, the, the, the social media or Facebook of yesterday. That is super important, but it's maybe not necessarily the only conversation we should have. So in the European Union, to a certain extent, we have done the low-hanging fruit, which is uh, the GDPR is sort of done, it is in force. There is an e-privacy regulation, which is the little brother to the GDPR in the making, and may come within, I don't know, a year or two, whatever the policy makers have first the time frame. By the way, the e-privacy regulation <coughs> is the one which regulates how privacy is dealt specifically on devices like this. Now, that, that we have done. That's low-hanging fruit. And that's actually focusing on personal data. But maybe in this future world, we should be focusing on another set of data, which are the non-personal data. So this other category of data, which is open data, business data, scientific data, data from our healthcare system or transportation systems, these are non-personal data in most of the cases, or pseudonymized or anonymized data. So, what, what are the rules of the road for, for those data? And when President Abe made his proposal, this is a little bit what resonated in Europe very strongly. They kind of, yes, we need a governance model, model for those as well. And there, I don't think the policy disagreements are as strong as they may be on personal data, because personal data are linked to values. Business data are not necessarily, at least in this podium, linked to any different values. I think here is fairly easy. So which comes back to 
What are the technologies? What are the portability rules? What are the free flow of data rules for the non-personal data space, which probably at the end will be the much more lucrative business? Because when I listen to IoT people talk to me, they say, humans are great, but they're limited in number. <laughs> Devices are not. So probably the future world will have much more non-personal data than personal data. So I, I think this is something I wanted, this, this idea I wanted to put in your mind. I want you to as well think about it, because I think this is something very much under development. But it fundamentally links to the storyline of, of international data flows, lowering the cost of those data flows. Engineers can do anything, but we want to have standards. And our standards in terms of technology, standards in terms of business, and standards in terms of regulation for those, for those data. And I think over time, we'll have to spend more time in this conversation. And this is maybe where I would stop my introduction and would be happy to contribute to the conversation. Thank you, Peter. And it, what you're saying actually, uh, maybe it links up. I, in my mind, it links up to some of what uh, Representative Del Bene was saying about kind of definitionally what qualifies as personal data. It sounds like in the European context, that dividing line between what is personal and what is kind of non-personal data that might be more free-flowing, that that's going to be an active debate or already is an active debate in Europe. But um, we can follow up on that. Um, OK, Chandra, uh, your perspective, please. Um, well, picking up on the economic theme, um, and there have been a lot of references already to Prime Minister Abe's uh, speech in Davos, but one of the many things that he said uh, was the engine of growth no longer relies on gasoline but on digital data, and I think that's very true. And so I work at BSA, and we represent um, global software companies, and I think the, the economic impact is something to highlight. So for example, in the United States alone, um, software-enabled innovation has contributed to over 10.5 million jobs and over a trillion dollars in GDP. And in 2017, US exports and telecommunications, um, computers, and information services, including software services, totaled over $42 billion. Um, and so our companies are really leading um, with cutting edge innovat innovative technologies, including cloud computing and AI, but it's really not, the, the story doesn't stop at the economic story, right? So for example, um, they're also transforming society. Um, they're using technology to help doctors develop treatment plans um, to treat cancer patients. Uh, they're making products more accessible for people who are disabled, including with visual impairments. And so this is, I think it's important to recognize the type of technology when we talk about digital governance and the impact that it's having, because I think we need to understand the incentives um, for actually ensuring that that data does flow appropriately. Um, and I think there are a lot of shared goals here. So for example, um, we want to harness data so that we can deliver these really valuable products and services, but at the same time, we want to protect that data and we want to make sure that it's secure. Um, and we also want to be able to transfer it globally because these are not benefits that are just for the United States, they're for every country all over the world. Um, and so when we're looking at this, it's a very interesting discussion about the intersection between privacy and security um, and innovation and globalization. Uh, and so we've, we've hit on a lot of themes today, but I think the one word that I would focus on is actually interoperability. Um, and the real question for me um, is not necessarily whose rules do, do we adopt, um, but almost the contrary, which is you know, no matter what your domestic situation is, how do you make these different um, systems interoperable? Um, and so for example, there are three ways that you could do this. There are more, but I'll highlight three. Uh, and the first is part of um, what Congresswoman, Congresswoman Del Binney was highlighting with respect to trade. So whether it's a bilateral trade agreement, whether it's a multilateral trade agreement, looking um, at that discipline to address data-related market access barriers. And those show up in many different forms. Um, some of the rationales that we've heard often um, are privacy um, and security to justify data localization measures. And those may be measures that require local computing facilities or infrastructure or data centers. Um, to be built in country, they may require um, the storage of data in that country for a copy, a copy of that data to be stored in the country. They may prevent the export of that data out of the country, and so they manifest themselves in different ways, and we've seen this occur in China and in Indonesia and in Vietnam's new cybersecurity law and in Russia. Um, and so data localization is, is a real challenge. Um, and along those, 
lines. Um, we talked a little bit about standards. We've seen country-specific standards imposed, um, and particularly with respect to cybersecurity, and so it's another data-related market access barrier. Um, but in any event, when we're talking about how do we solve these problems, well, we can build upon what we've already seen in CPTPP and in USMCA with respect to countries coming together and acknowledging the importance of cross-border data flows and the importance of prohibiting those types of data localization measures. And so this trade discipline is one aspect. Another really is the development of, of domestic law in a way that incorporates the ability to transfer data abroad. Uh, and so these data governance, national data governance models build in um, cross-border data transfer, transfer protections. Um, we've seen this in the EU, um, although there are certainly restrictions in the EU, the GDPR actually uh, has more mechanisms to transfer data um, than, the, than its precursor, which was the directive. Um, but still there are restrictions there. Um, adequacy, obviously, is the default standard, um, and there are other mechanisms to transfer data, but there are legal challenges to those, and so that remains an area of focus. Um, particularly in emerging markets, I think there is a significant area of concern. We've talked a little bit about India, um, and people may know that there was a proposal that was not yet introduced in Parliament, but that proposal um, would have also, it would have done a lot of things, but it would have established a, a, a data protection law in India, uh, but with respect to cross-border data transfers, it would have imposed significant restrictions and was actually less flexible uh, than GDPR. And so, for example, you they created a similar adequacy construct, which, which GDPR has, um, and they would have permitted um, transfers based on contractual clauses with some restrictions, but there was this ability of the Indian government to designate certain da data as quote-unquote critical data, uh, and it could prevent the export of that data. And there were also data localization provisions requiring a copy of that data um, in that bill as well. Um, and as recently, I think as um, last week, there was another government agency in India that released a draft um, national e-commerce proposal, and so this wasn't actual legislation, it's more of a policy roadmap um, about a, a number of things on e-commerce issues in India, and the first chapter of that proposal is on data and actually um, proposes even more restrictive proposals, uh, policy proposals, on the transfer of data outside of India than the proposed data protection law does, which was fairly restrictive. Um, and so I think we're seeing these policies emerge, and the rationales are, are many. Um, you know, there were privacy, there were security, there was the, the fear of foreign surveillance, there's the, the impetus to, to surveil domestically, um, there are the economic reasons, um, which I don't think really um, play out in the way that they, they hope. So for example, I think a lot of companies are looking at um, the short term economic gain. So for example, you have a data center that's built there, um, spending a lot of money up front, um, but they're not looking at um, how that changes once the data center is built. They're not looking at the subsidies that they'd have to pay for for electricity for that data center. They're not looking at the increased costs for domestic customers. They're not looking at the loss of access to foreign markets. Um, and so I think uh, even though one of the motivations, I think, is sort of economic protectionism, I don't, I don't think it sort of achieves that goal. Um, and so I guess that's sort of the second, the second component. And I didn't mention the United States, surprisingly. <laughs> um, but the United States obviously has a very important national conversation uh, going on around privacy. And I think it's really important um, for many reasons I'll highlight too. First, there's just the importance of building trust and, and, and protecting the American consumer's privacy. Um, and secondly, I think um, it's also important for global leadership. Uh, and I think as was mentioned earlier, it's, it's hard to export the US model when it is not well understood uh, and when the standards aren't clear and when more protections, we, we truly believe that more protections should be in place. Um, and so I think that's a real priority. Uh, BSA has been out in front and um, our CEO testified last week at the Senate Commerce hearing and she essentially um, highlighted three things, the importance of user rights, uh, consumer rights, uh, the importance of strong company obligations, uh, and last, lastly, strong enforcement. And so with respect to consumer rights, she highlighted the importance of the right to know, which is transparency, the right to choose, and the right to uh, control personal information. Uh, and with respect to strong obligations for companies, security is a big part of that, but I think also this notion of use, using data in ways that consumers expect. Uh, and so you can't just rely on notice and choice alone. I think everyone understands that they're that's not enough, that companies need to do more, and, and how they use that information is really important. And last but certainly not least is having a strong enforcer at, at the, both the federal and state level. 
Uh, and so those are really key components of what we think would be um, important protections in a domestic law, but that domestic law also uh, sends signals abroad, and I think that's something we can build upon um, to have these conversations about interoperability. Um, and so that's with respect to the domestic regimes. And, and lastly, I'll just say, you know, you look at sort of trade agreements, you look at these, these domestic policies that, that countries are developing, um, and the third thing is there are things like the APEC CBPR system, which is this voluntary framework, but it's backed up um, with enforcement agencies from all over the APEC uh, region. And this is an, um, a project that's grown over the last several years. It now has eight participating economies. Um, and they actually just wrapped up meetings last week. And it's just yet another example of how you can create uh, another space for, for data governance and, and for trust among, among countries or economies that have very different domestic regimes, but the whole premise of that regime working is to make them interoperable. Um, and obviously, you know, we have Pre um, Prime Minister Abe's uh, free flow of data framework, which we will want to hear more about and, and sort of query where that falls, but just, it's yet another avenue of, of getting together and figuring out you know, whether it's industrial data or personal information, how do you protect it and how do you allow it to flow in a way that ensures innovation, um, but is just also protective of, of people's privacy. That's great. great. Um, thanks to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm now kind of questioning what direction to take this in because there's so much here to dig into. Um, it is uh, about 3.15 right now. Um, we're gonna spend 15 minutes or so uh, with some questions here, and then we'll leave time for you. So I need to choose carefully how I'm gonna use those 15 minutes. Um, let, me, let me query a little bit, um, following on a question that went to the Congresswoman, but I think it would be interesting, Peter, to hear your perspective, and maybe Chandra, you as well. This, um, this critique of GDPR as posing um, hurdles to competitiveness um, for companies and for smaller companies in particular. Um, I'm wondering how that sounds to your ears, if you, you see that criticism or critique as, as legitimate. And Chandra, maybe if you want to come in and kind of share your views on that, whether that's a legitimate criticism or not, and then I welcome anybody else on the panel to weigh sure. in. I mean, I'll just say, with respect to GDPR, I think sort of we share the overarching aim of GDPR, which is to give consumers more control over their information and make companies more accountable for safeguarding personal information is the goal that we share. Um, I think uh, it was implemented, uh, the effective date was May 25th, so it hasn't been a year yet, and I think we'll have to watch closely to see what, what the effects are um, and you know the operational challenges that companies are experiencing, um, what's working, what's not. Um, we've even heard, for example, they have a, a data breach notification requirement, which is something we really support, but the timeline um, is 72 hours where feasible when we're reporting to, to an authority. And, and we've heard EU DPA say, look, everyone is reporting everything. You know, we're being flooded with reports, and now they, they are trying to actually focus on the really important things, but they are getting reports for everything because there are you know, some amb ambiguity about, I'm, I forgot that you were sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> I just love all my um, there was some ambiguity about um, those reporting standards, right? And so, um, and that's EU DPA is just sharing information. Um, and so they've said, look, don't report everything. So I think the DPAs are figuring it out. I think the companies are figuring out. And I think we'll just have to watch that space a little closely. With respect to small business in, in particular, I think you know it's just a different system. And I, there are an EU civil code system, and there are a lot of administrative requirements. And I think that's part of the reason why you've seen companies just pull out of Europe um, because they didn't want to address those things. But I'll also say that you know our companies, a lot of our companies provide cloud computing services, and, and those services actually enable small companies to comply, um, to comply with, with laws like GDPR. And so I think there are two two sides to that that coin as well. Yeah. Peter, uh, I think or I hope at least it goes without saying that we, when we crafted the GDPR, we were thinking about innovation startups, small firms. I mean, it took the better part of 10 years to make it happen, so that was part of the narrative. But I'm not going back in the, into that. Um, uh, I think we have to dis differentiate here between two notions. The one is risk, and the one is the sort of small firm. Now, in, in the GDPR, you will find certain exceptions which apply to certain type of companies. 
But don't, don't forget Cambridge Analytica was an SME, was a small firm, posing a huge risk. So company size is no measure for the risk in this new data world. So therefore, we, we have to be a bit careful. I agree with all we say, but as you say, Paul, the devil is in the detail. When you have to put the pen down, it's like, ah, have you considered this? Well, yes, small companies can pose a risk. European economy is 23 million companies, of which more than 99% are, are small and medium-sized companies with less than 250 people. So we talk about the large majority of the economy, which generates a large chunk of the GDP and has two-thirds of the employment. So we did pay attention to them. And I don't think here what we have come up with is an extraordinary burden on their work. By the way, talking about burden, um, Representative Del Bene was talking quite casually about, you know, for SMEs, this is going to be super life here, here in the U.S. if there is going to be a federal privacy regulation. And then she pointed out in another part of, there will be annual reviews by external organizations. There will be FTC and private right of action enforcement. That sounds like bureaucracy to me, <laughs> frankly speaking. You know, that's cost for a company. So we also have to be sort of a bit honest to, with each other in this conversation. This is not going to go without effort. It's not going to be, go to be free lunch for everybody and easy going. No, this will be a fundamental change of the rules if it happens in this country as it was in Europe. And it's a fundamental change for the better. That's a th that was the idea, and that's, that's also what is playing out right now. And this answers to your question of, if you make a, a change, a fundamental change, whether this is taking place on the 26th of March, um, May 2018, or a few months later, or a year later, doesn't matter. Because what you put is you put the whole economy on the road for a change, which makes it fit for the future. That was the idea. So mm -hmm. dates, individual dates don't necessarily play a role. And this is why you see the European Data Protection Board, I mean, coming up now with regulations, because they also figure things out while they're walking that way. Right. Oh, yeah, that's, that's an important And I would just add, uh, I mean, I think on interoperability, I, I, I meant to mention interoperability, of course, it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's a great word, but I think that, that things like Privacy Shield and, and these other measures are attempts to, to, to bridge some of these these um, differences in the legal system. And I think, again, this, this is the same discussion that's happening in a place like China um, with radically different, <laughs> one could argue, uh, legal system and legal enforcements and, and uh, legal remedies. Um, but there's still uh, a lot of work going on to understand what interoperability would mean um, with, with Europe in particular and, and also the US. And at the same time, the, the, you know, there, there, a lot of data is flowing across borders. <laughs> um, and so uh, part, part of it, this is, is sort of learning from experience and then figuring out a framework that, that, that uh, that'll, will continue to allow that data to flow. So I think the search for interoperability is probably the sort of watchword in some of these big areas like big countries like China and India and Russia too is, is, is in the mix here because they, they, the governments there realize, don't, you know, that again, they don't want to make the, the, cut the country off from the rest of the world in terms of data, um, but we're in this kind of game where now we're, 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 where everybody's searching for the best way to do that inter interoperability, whether it's through a trade agreement, whether it's through um, a bilateral agreement, or whether it's through something like um, Privacy Shield. Um, so there's a lot of, of searching, and there's a feeling that we've got to get this right before things like 5G and AI really take off. Mm. Right. And actually, before we switch off of this topic, I wanted to go back, um, and before we switch off GDPR, this idea of adequacy, the determination of adequacy. I'm wondering, Peter, if you could talk, you know, kind of at a, a general 25,000 foot level of what is it that um, the EU actually looks for in terms of, of determining adequacy? What are the principles or the tenets behind it? Well, the, the concept of adequacy is, I think, a very elegant way of, of trying to find partners who, who have a similar regulatory regime, but not mm -hmm. necessarily exactly the same. So that's, as the word kind of suggests, and that's where it comes, they have an adequate level. Now, in, in this process of adequacy, we, we went through once, because right now we, we have essentially, I mean, there are a couple of other but they're not necessarily as, as, as different as the one from Japan. So mm -hmm. I think that was the real big example where both sides learned how can that process work. Sort of what, what are the rules there? And essentially is uh, the elements. Uh, what are the individual, what are the rights the afforded to the individual? I mean, is there to be the, the right uh, for, for information 
Do you have the right, for instance, quite interesting, the right to be forgotten is maybe a unique thing. It's not necessarily to, it's not necessary to have it in all the ones where you will find adequacy. So, so the rights afforded is one block. Another huge block in that is there a practical way to enforce those rights? So how are they working? Is that right accessible? This is another thing. So are the mechanisms there? It's not just the right on the paper. Are the structures behind it? This is something, for instance, we see with the privacy shield. This is one of the issues there. You may have things on paper, but if they are not exist in reality, they are of little value to the consumer and to the businesses. Mm. So it's, it's essentially the chapters, I would almost say the chapters you find in the GDPR or the main lines you find in any privacy, privacy legislation or principles around the world. Do you find them again and to which degree are they encoded and enforceable, those rights? And there's probably not much more because it will have to come down at the end of the day to a one-to-one -one checking. And this is what also my, my people at Hatwater tell me. Yes, of course, there are those rules, as I was just describing. But at the end of the day, it's also something where we'll have to go into a probably years-long process of negotiation to understand, is this adequate? Mm. Can we sort of live? Can we connect our greenhouses together and have them sealed off to the rest of the world? Because this is sort of the notion we are having here. Can we build a collective group of greenhouses which are connected nicely together, where we can grow our data economies in there? Mm -hmm. um, that's very helpful, and I actually want to turn now to Naoki as far yeah. as, I mean, Japan's in this unique situation yep. because, one, Prime Minister Abe's mm -hmm. leadership, but mm -hmm. it actually is um, party to EU-Japan agreement where it's subject to this determination of adequacy. Yes. It's also um, a member and a leading mm -hmm. member of CPTPP and a member of CBPR. Yep. Um, and so can you talk to harmonization, Japan's mm -hmm. experience with harmonization and specifically as relates to those two trade agreements? Well, um, so having had the, the adequacy uh, recognition with EU, um, um, amongst the business leaders, there are uh, general concern about the operational challenges, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I talk to business leaders in Japan, they see um, the data monopolies more problem than the having operational challenges. Hmm. So they believe their, um, the kind of rules like GDPR will open up um, opportunity to them rather than the uh, adding additional costs. That is data monopolies is yeah. the bigger challenge. Yeah. Well, that's right. a perfect lead into my next. And I'm talking question. about uh, personal data in Japan, <laughs> uh, uh, there is an estimation that uh, more than 60% of personal data of Japanese people are going out, mainly to GAFA. Hmm. <laughs> that's that really concerns business readers. Only 60. Only 60. <laughs> yeah, point 60. Yeah. yeah. Well. I, I think this is related to a question. It didn't come up explicitly in the Congresswoman's comments, but another issue that is very much at play um, in the United States with some of the, the proposals out there is this question of, of monetization of data um, or the, the, I guess it's the valueize the data. Um, and one metric mm -hmm to address this issue of data monopoly would be um, how do you actually figure out a way to assign a value to that data? Um, so I'm wondering, actually, this is for, for any of the panelists, um, as far as uh, the possibility of assigning values to that data, the wisdom of proposals that would actually have technology companies assign some sort of value to data, is that feasible and is it wise, whether we're talking about the U.S. context or um, globally? Can, is this something that can be done and should be done? If I start from a European perspective, you know, the, the GDPR is an implementation of a fundamental value in the constitutional setup of the European Union. So it's, 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 there is no economic incentive to do so. It was a, a value and philosophical incentive and it was supposed to be done and has to be done as it is uh, fundamental value. So, so therefore this notion of 
assigning an economic value to it was never part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's part mm -hmm. of the constitution, so you got to find the implementing rules for that constitutional element. That's the GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, I find it personally very, very interesting, and, and we, we are curious on how this is going to work out, because I think it's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. um, if I may give you my view, um, it seems that uh, there is a the very difficult trade-off between uh, protecting privacy and monetizing data. But uh, um, data portability together with um, institutionalized opt-in model. The opt-out model doesn't work. The opt-in model uh, can uh, enable uh, many companies use data. Um, there's a concept in Japan called uh, data trust bank. And uh, the private sector will authenticate an institution uh, to use data with uh, opt-in that they got from the people and uh, the full control over their data. That's still work in progress in Japan, but we will open up opportunity right. to break up the, the trade-off between use of data and protecting their privacy. Yeah, and in that model, just to clarify, that model is one where it's the consumer that has control yeah. over yeah. the data yeah. as opposed to yes. whomever they're giving the data to. Yeah. But there's also a, a concern that a lot of these services that GAFA provides are are, are free of charge, and so if, if somebody opts out of those, then then they're then in some cases the, the question is should they be then, then allowed to have you mm -hmm. know benefit from the service? So I think that's a lot. There's a lot of discussion on that, both mm -hmm. again in EU and China and, and the U.S. about how do you if somebody does opt out, what do you do about that? Should should the com the companies then be able to say okay, well if you're opting out, then we're not going to mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you, you you don't have access to the service. I think the other thing is, is that that in terms of the monetization, I mean there's a lot of talk about, and there's a lot of, of, of data, for example, personal data that's anonymized, but then is used to tr train AI algorithms, mm -hmm. right? And so you could, you could almost, you know, that, that seems like a different case where somebody, again, is sort of opting in and saying, well, for the, for the greater good, I'm going to allow my personal data to be used. Now, mm -hmm. should they be compensated for that? You know, mm -hmm. that, that's a, a good question. But there, there's a whole category of data that where, where the benefit is sort of, you know, a, a general benefit to the society, whether it's training AI algorithms to, to do diagnosis, whatever, and th that that's a, a different sort of category of data. Yeah. And there, maybe you could, I could see some discussion about whether people should be compensated. But for sort of personal data that you're giving to social media platforms, I think that's a that may be less relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Chandra, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this issue uh, has come up in the context of, so for example, there was a California privacy law passed, the CCPA, uh, and there was a provision, it requires you not to discriminate, um, but then it says you can. Uh, it has this phrase if it's uh, sort of the, the differing price or level of service is reasonably related to the value of the consumer's data to the consumer or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it comes up there and it, I think um, there has just been a, a challenge in understanding how you determine, how does a business determine what the value of that sort of individual piece of data is and to the consumer versus to the business. So there are a lot of questions about what standards you apply there. Um, I think it also came up in that context because uh, the way the California law is drafted is it's, um, it targets the quote unquote sale of data, which is defined broadly, but so when, it, when you're talking about an actual sale, um, at least there's this, this potentially something to compare it to, you know, query whether that actually works when you get outside of that context, which is, is, is hard to understand even in that context, in mm -hmm. a broader context, you know, mm -hmm. how, how would you apply that regime? So I just think there are a lot of um, is important issues to consider um, when, when evaluating it. Okay, um, let me see time-wise. Okay, I will keep to my promise uh, and turn the questions uh, over to all of you. Um, we do have microphones here. Um, would ask uh, that you raise your hand. The microphone will find you if you could uh, just state your name and your affiliation, um, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. Any any questions? Oh, have one over here. Uh, hi, Pete Selvridge with SAP. Um, we are uh, uh, two, hopefully I can ask two quick questions. One, we're hearing rumors that um, CAC in China as part of the trade deal negotiated might narrow the scope around their flow of data uh, for data portability. I wondered if you had heard that. Um, and secondly, um, as one of the skeptical Americans on um, sort of ensuring privacy, having been a federal government employee, 
whose data was um, breached, let's say, um, a few years ago, how do you sort of regain the trust of uh, the American public or even the global public around protecting data going, uh, going forward? Okay. So, yeah, I think on the first question, let me just quickly tackle that. Yeah, but we've heard that there's a lot of um, things being, being brought into the trade discussions. Uh, uh, now, I think the original um, uh, list of U.S. demands that were partially leaked last May in Beijing um, uh, didn't include specific uh, issues related to the cybersecurity law, but, but certainly we, we understood that those were on the, the, the broader annex that was included in that. So, uh, and the two issues really were the cybersecurity review of network products and services and this issue of cross-border data flows um, and how that's going to be implemented. Now, as I mentioned, they haven't really, they, they haven't really finalized the measures for the cross-border data flows, um, and so uh, they were supposed to issue the final uh, measures uh, by the end of last year, and that still hasn't happened. So it'll be interesting to see how that how this comes out, because because I think uh, it will require them internally uh, to to sort of look at, at, at how that those regulations are going to be issued and released publicly, and then and how they're going to be enforced. So definitely, I think data and uh, data issues are have become a big part of the, of the trade negotiations. Um, other issues like cloud services are, are in the mix also, and so I think coming out of the trade negotiations will be some clarity on how China is going to uh, implement and enforce some, some part of its data governance regime. So that's definitely in the mix. And just on the last part of your question, um, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think it's important to acknowledge that the American people's trust has been broken. Um, and I think privacy is forefront in their minds because it's actually impacting them in concrete ways. So people are experiencing data breaches from retailers or companies they know or companies they don't know. Um, and it's affecting their lives um, and they understand the risk a bit more. Uh, and I do think just to acknowledge it is important to rebuild that trust. Um, and, and there are many ways to do that. I think this conversation is about that. Like we were thinking of some ways, maybe there are others. Um, but first and foremost, I think they need to keep the promises that they make to consumers, which is existing law, right? Um, so the FTC enforces a law that requires you sort of not to be, make unfair or deceptive practices. And so that's part of the deception component. Um, and then the second thing I think is, as we've seen, I think companies and our companies have, um, BSA companies have advocated um, for these types of privacy protections for a long time and they operate globally and so they comply with GDPR and other laws around the world and so they've been pretty far ahead of this for a while but I think we want sort of all companies in the ecosystem to ensure that they use data in appropriate ways um, and, and to prevent misuse and do they have internal mechanisms to, to prevent that misuse um, and are they committing to do that. Um, the, uh, we, I talked earlier about the right to know, I mean transparency which again is, is, is alone is not uh, enough, but it's also very important. Are you explaining to consumers in plain English how you're going to use their data, the type of data that you're collecting and how you're going to use it? Um, there's also needs to be more transparency um, about um, other actors in the ecosystem. Uh, and so I think there are just a number of, of ways that you can, can get at this. Um, and I think it's a really important conversation to have. You know, are we crafting rules that are really going to have an impact and that are really going to sort of bring, raise the bar for the entire ecosystem to rebuild that trust. Yeah, and I mean, it's striking for anybody that's been following this issue is obviously these folks have been very closely, I'm sure many of you, how, um, how much the debate has shifted in the United States from even kind of a year and a half ago, it was still kind of a viable position to say, we actually have privacy regulation already, depending on the industry segment, and there isn't really a need for anything on a national level. You don't hear many saying that now. Um, and I think it is for the reasons that you mentioned, and also what Chandra said, I think it is, um, imperative to the business models of many of these companies that they maintain the trust and they can't do that unless there is um, the protections that people are now aware of, I guess, that maybe they weren't. I think Cambridge Analytica ago. certainly opened people's eyes. Absolutely. And then uh, there's also, I think, a sense of, of a, a, a desire to avoid fragmentation so by having, not having every state have a law. So I think industry is very eager to see a national legislation. Yeah. Um, there's a question right here, man in the bow tie. Thank you. Um, Logan Finucane from Access Partnership. So going back to Prime Minister Abe's suggestion 
Uh, when calling for discussions towards a global governance fr uh, data governance framework, uh, he suggested the WTO as a potential platform to discuss or, you know, who knows if it's that the WTO even someday enforce such a framework. What do you think about that institution as a platform to have these sorts of discussions? Um, and if not the WTO, where should leaders be having these discussions to try to converge policies and make interoperability happen? Good question. Uh, well, um, I think the, uh, um, the more than 70 countries' members already started to, to dis explore the opportunity to create new rules around the, uh, the e-commerce. But uh, the question is mainly around how to uh, define trust at a very higher level uh, so that uh, all participants uh, can be comfortable about the, uh, the, the, um, the using rules. So trust uh, may include uh, secure, ensure higher the privacy and the security amongst the countries. I think that's a very difficult part uh, to reach the, uh, the consensus amongst the countries. Anybody else have views kind of on where, I think this was also related to, to some of the questions that the Congresswoman uh, fielded. Well, uh, I think the underlying assumption is that we always need more than a bilateral conversation on that. I mean, that's just sort of the minimum starting point. And then if you follow international fora, I guess you know, the next smallest job is G7. And then you go to G20, you have 20 there, you go to WTO, 70 plus, and you may end up with United Nations with uh, close to everybody. Mm -hmm. sort of. So I, I think the question here is, is it where is the line where we sort of can, or what is the group of sort of reasonably like-minded country where we can have that conversation? It may not be everybody on the planet, but it will certainly be more than G7, where we see, you know, that's, I wouldn't say ticked off necessarily, but there's a lot of common declarations on that for many, many years. So I think time is in the sweet spot, maybe the WTO right now, you know, where we have all the right countries there. If we get something going on, on that level, that would be a fantastic outcome. At least from a European Union perspective, we, we definitely heavily invest in, in particularly the WTO for, uh, for many reasons right now. And what about then the, the skepticism that I think we heard um, Representative Del Bene express about the inclusion of China actually threatens to, to lower the standard to such a degree as you really don't have anything meaningful there? Um, looking at you, Paul, but again, I welcome anyone to weigh in. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. That, that, and that's sort of, I think, more of a political issue. I think what we'll have to see what comes out of the trade negotiations and how some of these issues are handled. Hopefully there'll be sort of a more positive movement on issues like data. Um, there have been, again, these discussions around China considering something like joining CBPR, which, mm -hmm. which would be really uh, you know, a, huge, a huge move. Um, and so I think that, that it, 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 we, have to, we have to sort of wait and see on that. So I think, I think because China would be such a big player in this, I think um, maybe, maybe within a multilateral forum, that would be the best way to approach the issue of, of bringing China into, into best practices globally. Now, that obviously, that would be very challenging because of the nature of the Chinese system and concern about government access to data, et cetera, um, which, which has been a big discussion in the last you know, few months, too, over a lot of different uh, incidents. Um, so I think, you know, that's, but, but I think that's probably the, the, the approach that, would, that most people would argue was probably um, going to get Beijing's attention, again, a multilateral approach to the WTO. Um, and move China forward on some of these things. But obviously, it's going to be a very long and mm -hmm. difficult discussion um, given some of the political issues around uh, China and data. Hmm. We have a question here in the front row. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO that works on peace building and conflict resolution. It seems to me there really are different alternative realities here. On the one hand, there's increasing skepticism by citizens of many countries, democracies included, as to the integrity of their own governments. And in the United States, we certainly have seen this from our very own president of the United States who attacks our own agencies. In China, where I have been, and also in Central Asia, certainly citizens there are extremely wary of intrusions. If you're a Uyghur, you're not in very good shape, whether in 
Kazakhstan or China or, or elsewhere. So I guess the question is how can one trust at all any agreements that are reached? You've talked about a multilateral net, maybe, maybe, but then that has to be monitored and watched. I'd also like to ask about Russia, which has been gifted with some really uh, intelligent people in AI and a real impetus for that kind of theoretical work. Could you say something about that and how some of the democratization forces can be helpful there in ensuring security of data and advances in AI that are, are helpful to people, not inimical to them? Who would like to, to field either of those? Yeah, I have to say, I, I think your the first question is something that overrides so much of the U.S.-China um, engagement right now. Um, so it's it's a good question. It's a fundamental question to this discussion. And I just would would add to that, um, just if you bring it down a little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, that's actually a key part of the APEC cross-border privacy rule system. And so the, the key component that sort of gives it its credibility is this enforcement backstop. And, and economies actually have to sign on to the APEC cross-border, their, their independent um, enforcement authority has to sign on to the cross-border privacy enforcement arrangement as the first precondition for it joining up to the APEC CBPR program. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think the fact that that's the first step mm -hmm. really shows how important that enforcement is in that, um, in that setting. And one of the key features of that system is that it has accountability agents. And so it takes the pressure off of these smaller agencies who may not have the resources to really police everything because you have a neutral third party that's checking to see whether or not these companies who voluntarily said that they would comply with these program requirements are complying. And so that added level of protection, I think, is really important. But when that doesn't work, you still have um, agencies that are enforcement back backstops. And so the FTC in the United States is the enforcement agency here, and the FTC has brought cases um, when companies have, for example, voluntarily said that they complied with that framework and they haven't. Um, and so I think that enforcement component is really how you give the system, a system like that, trust and credibility. Mm. Yeah, and obviously in the case of China, it's going to be very difficult to have an independent, to have a credible independent data protection authority, if you will, uh, uh, that, that's going to be credible. But, you know, that, that's sort of, as you say, a fundamental piece of CBPR. So any discussion around this is going to have to center on how, how, does, mm. how do countries like China in particular um, meet some of those standards uh, in a way that's credible to the other members of, thing, of something like CBPR. It's going to be really difficult. Say something. <laughs> Russia. <laughs> she said, say something about Russia. Um, well, Russia. A, the, a, the issue. You, your question was specifically about AI, right? Well, just generally. You well, said that there is that computer technology. Right. Well, Russia, as somebody I think mentioned, you know, Russia has been, um, has things like data localization laws on the books, and they've been gradually over the last uh, two years in particular sort of rolling out enforcement uh, efforts on that uh, and, and go meeting with social media companies and making sure that they're actually localizing data. Some, some companies have chosen not to, not to comply with that. Um, so Russia has a very interesting place in the global um, internet space. They're also testing recently uh, ways to disconnect the whole Russian internet from the global internet and run on sort of a local domain name uh, system. So Russia has a lot of concern about, um, uh, about how the, the yeah, particularly the, the, what they perceive as a threat from the United States in terms mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, potential attacks on the Russian, uh, on Russian cyberspace. So, so Russia is, is an interesting, interesting place there. I, I'm not sure, on um, an AI, I think um, Russia is, there are no, as far as I can tell, there are no major Russian companies and players that are, that are competing, for example, against the, the Googles and the Microsofts and, and, uh, in, in the AI space. I'm sure they have a lot of very capable people, but the, the, the focus of AI development in, in, in the US and in China, for example, are the big platform companies that have a lot of the data and can train the algorithms mm -hmm. um, and are sort of driving the field forward. I, I gather Russia probably has some pretty good R&D on AI. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure how much they're contributing into some of the global conferences around AI, but um, uh, I, would, I would expect them to, to be a bigger player given what Putin has said about the, the importance of, of, uh, of AI in general. Um, so I hope that gets it done. Can I say one thing about China? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. um, to, so regarding trust, um, we, we need to break up trust in, into some different building blocks. 
And uh, one of them is um, the data localization. And in my view, data localization is net negative in the long run. In short term, uh, it will allow to protect domestic industry, but in the long run, it's net negative. And uh, in China, they introduced the, uh, a new cybersecurity law back in 2016. And uh, when it comes to data localization, China defined data in a very broad manner. Not only include uh, national security data, but uh, also the business data they included. So that's why that concerned the, the non-Chinese company uh, really, uh, you know, the, they're not sure what, what's going to happen to the business in China. So um, concerning the, the data localization, uh, we can negotiate with China so that uh, they can more properly define the data in their data secu uh, cyber security law. That's one example. So when it comes to the privacy, it may take time to harmonize the, the concept of the ensuring privacy the, between China and other Western countries. We have to be realistic. And uh, my sense is that uh, we, can, we should break up the, the trust into the different pieces and then negotiate step by step. Um, I see that our, our, closing, uh, our closing comments, closing speaker is here with Ambassador Holliman. Um, I would want to ask one question, actually teeing off of that last one, that gets to the specific issue of, of data and digital governance, but it also has um, broader meaning, again, in the context of US-China. And that's the question of reciprocity, um, the question of whether or not if China or Russia or anyone else is not willing to share their data with Europe, with Japan, with the US, then is it fair and right for that country to impose the same rules? Um, what are your views <laughs> collectively on the issue of reciprocity and whether or not reciprocity is something that should be kind of in the toolkit for data um, governance? I think that's a question you can approach from two ways. On the one hand, if you, if you were to be a sort of a data system architect, you know, you, you, reciprocity requires the same set of rules. So you would certainly start designing systems and processes which suggest you know, if you don't comply the same standards, same rules, you're outside that, that, that world. Now then comes the real world. You know, then comes uh, the economy. Then comes the companies you work with, then comes politics into the game, which means the question becomes much broader. And then there will be exceptions made. And, and frankly speaking, uh, one, one exception is privacy shield in the, in, in the relationship Europe to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we recognize here the, the fact that a lot of the data, probably most of the personal data of Europeans, are processed here in the United States, and it's not in their interest of Europe to cut off that line, even if there's no adequate privacy regulation in that country. So therefore, the privacy shield was, was installed as, as a mechanism to give us at least time to understand how we can deal with that issue. So I, th I think from a theoretical point of view, yes, that will lead to issues. But from a practical point of view, common sense does prevail sometimes. And, and therefore, things I hope at least will work out. Any other thoughts on this question of reciprocity? Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do what Matt did and ask you to please stay in your seats before we thank the panelists. Um, we have uh, Ambassador Holliman uh, to give closing comments and Jim Lewis, Director of our Technology Policy Program <coughs> here, um, to, uh, to introduce him and then do a, a Q&A. But um, please first um, join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.
old friend and, of course, one of the country's leading experts on this issue. He was, as you all know, the deputy U.S. trade representative. Um, he's currently the president and CNO, CEO of C&M International, which is a partner with Crow and Mooring's International Trade Group. Um, many of us know Robert, of course, from his uh, long tenure at BSA, the Software Alliance, where he was one of the key people in shaping federal policy on these issues for really about two decades. Is that right? Yeah, astounding. And then his work at the USTR included my own personal favorite, the JCCT, the Joint Committee on Commerce and Trade with China, which was always endless hours of fun. And then also working with India, which is, I hope, something we get a chance to talk about. Um, he created a new digital trade working group in USTR, and of course, uh, some people call it the Dirty Dozen, but he was one of the authors of the Digital Dozen, which Robert says is now up to 26. That's right. 26, so we're well past Digital Dozen. Um, the format will be, Robert will speak for uh, 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll have some Q&As back and forth, and then we'll open it up to you. So with that, please, Robert, go ahead. Great, thank you, thank you, Jim, and uh, thanks, everyone. I, I thought it would be good to follow this um, very instructive panel, uh, and I um, and Representative Del Bene's remarks, with some thoughts around both our topic today, um, but hopefully some thoughts as we as we look ahead. Um, first, I have uh, just returned. Uh, from Santiago, Chile, where I was down for the uh, first group of APEC meetings for this year with Chile as the host. Uh, we were part of uh, discussions around privacy and security and, and digital trade. Um, and I was um, part of a, a privacy panel last Monday uh, where in my um, closing remarks, I spoke um, about Prime Minister Abe's speech in Davos. And so it's a real pleasure to be here a week later uh, talking also where this discussion began today, which was the important and useful hook and discussion that the Prime, the Prime Minister established. Uh, my sense about the reason why that's important are really three things. One is it's extraordinarily rare for a prime minister or a president or the head of a government to speak about digital issues, but specifically around digital governance and trust. Secondly, there were elements of his discussion including things like examples of where we need cross-border data, uh, data while protecting personal privacy. His first one that he used was around medical data. And I think that that's significant because that is not typically something that people call out when they talk about cross-border data transfers because there is an assumption, which I think is erroneous, that you cannot have cross-border transfers of medical data for personal privacy reasons. In fact, you can protect personal privacy and have cross-border data flows. But I think getting that into discussion, and again, first in his list, um, so I don't know if he intended it to be the point of emphasis, but it struck me as right, is that's also one of the great contributors to improving health of people globally, which is not only economic growth, but it is also personal fulfillment and families and, and, and so for Japan with an aging population, as they look at health issues, I thought that is an incredibly important contribution to make in this. And finally, because of their role as the host of G20 this year, they have um, a significant ability to play on these data governance issues. Um, the second thing I'll say about Japan is that Japan also is probably in the most enviable place, I would argue, of any country in the world in terms of what's happening around trade and what's happening on digital issues. I mean, not only are they the host of the G20, but they are part of the 
CPTPP, uh, which is in effect, and in fact, Japan was one of the key drivers of the keeping the TPP together after, after the US pulled out. It's now in place with seven economies. Um, I was told that uh, just in the last week that the Malaysians definitely intend to move forward with it, uh, that Brunei intends to move forward with it. Um, you know, I think New Zealand will, so I think we will be back up to the full 11. And the digital provisions, the old dirty dozen, two dozen, you know, those provisions in the TPP are the most advanced in the world that are in place. There is no other agreement in the trade arena that is there. And issues around cross-border data flows are not new in trade agreements. Indeed, because I was just in Chile, if you look back at the U.S.-Chile Free Trade Agreement of 2004, it talked about cross-border data flows. So these issues are not new, but the complexity and the way the trade agreements are now embracing these is significant. Uh, so Japan is part of that. Japan has also gotten an adequacy determination from the EU for cross-border data transfers. And Japan was one of the countries, along with, uh, say, the US and others who were in uh, Santiago this week, who were talking about the future of the APEC cross-border privacy rules and talking about the possibility that at some point the APEC cross-border privacy rules may be expanded to include non-APEC economies. So there is a lot of thinking around these issues, what the granularity is, how do we move forward? Uh, so what to me are the key elements to, to consider in all this discussion? And I'm happy, Jim, to then move to your questions in the audience. One, there are issues around security that are critical. Uh, two, there are issues around privacy that are critical. Three, I think you have to have, and discussions of issues around choice. Um, how, to, how do consumers, how do governments make the choice in the technology? Four, you have to have discussions around interoperability. And I'd like to sort of delve into that because I think interoperability is a key part of how you look at all these discussions. And finally, you have to have discussions around the rules. Are there gonna be rules? If so, whose rules? What do we face in the world of these rules? And finally, this is all really designed to create trust and confidence. And so I talk periodically on digital trade, and I do think for purposes of this discussion, and I applaud CSIS and um, the team here for, for developing this idea, it's also important to realize that these discussions about digital governance and data governance are bigger than digital trade. Digital trade is enormously important, but it's a subset of these broader discussions around confidence, trust, integrity, privacy, and security. Um, and so I look forward to your questions and thank you for the chance to be here today. Thank you, Robert. And it was really irritating because you answered my first question. Ah, <laughs> ask it again. So I think I will. Um, for you, what does digital governance mean? What does data governance mean? And what are the what are the things we need to make it work? <clears throat> so the, you know, the things we need to, to make are to understand what it is and what it's not. And you know, just as I've seen the issues of data flows, going back to the US-Chile agreement, others for you know, 15 years or so now being part of trade agreements, um, you know, Jim and, Jim and I first met when we were both working on cybersecurity issues and, and, this, encryption. and encryption issues. Um, I think the privacy discussions in the privacy discussions, including as Representative Del Bene talked about, uh, including here in the US, do we develop a comprehensive privacy law or not? I think those discussions are getting uh, a lot more traction. But I think di digital governance is, is a bigger concept in the sense that it goes beyond individual consumers to this broader ecosystem or what are the mix of laws that allow us to trade? What are the mix of laws that allow us to improve our health, not just as individuals, but across borders? 
what are the mix of laws that ensure that um, there's confidence in the infrastructures that we're working with. And then finally, in this world where we also know that there um, is information that's being made available and that always will be in, in, in the sphere of the digital environment or the internet, how do people have confidence and trust in the information they get? And to me, that is everything from the systemic issues that we're not talking about as much today of how do you see elections and other issues being affected, but there are also issues around trust in the underlying data. So for example, when we talk about security, a lot of times there's issues, and we know that you know, there's insider threats to distributing information. But I also worry, and I think regulators should worry, is the underlying information that we get to make decisions around supervisory authority or things that are public interest, is that data ac actually accurate? And, or has that data been tampered with in some way that has a consequence not just to the institution, but to stability? And so I look at all of these things as being part of digital governance, data governance, because it's trust from the consumer level to the trust and confidence we have in our governments and our systems around how they work. When you think about this, and you've been thinking about it for a long time, do you look to any precedents? I mean, is it the, the International Monetary Institutes, or is it the, some of the monetary work, or is it privacy? Are there precedents for this, or is it de novo? Um, there are, I think there's not, there's not a precise precedent for this, um, because a lot of the institutions that we now take for granted and or used to take for granted in a post-World post War II environment were actually institutions created in the aftermath of war. And you know, I hope that the institutions that we're now creating around digital governance are not ones that require a war of that magnitude to be able in the aftermath to build these rules. I think we have the opportunity to try to get this right as best we can uh, without having a, a, a military or a cyber conflict. I do think we have competing models that are being developed. I mean, there's clearly a Chinese model of data sovereignty that is very different from the model of the CPTPP or even the new US-Mexico-Canada agreement, which adds a couple of provisions that go even beyond what are in the CPTPP. So I, I should, should say, because a lot of my former counterparts, you know, colleagues at USTR negotiated that, I mean, they got things in that agreement that added more benefits or more advanced than what we concluded five years ago in the CPTPP. But of course, it's not an effect until it gets ratified and puts in effect. So CPTP is still, is still the high standard. But there are competing models for how we deal with this, and the Chinese model is a very different model from certainly the one the US espouses. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is in you know, trade negotiations, where increasingly we're seeing these rules being written into trade negotiations, and I'd be happy to discuss that at length. Um, historically, the hardest thing to negotiate in trade agreements are rules around agriculture. And that's because there have been protections that have been put in agriculture by virtually every country that go back decades and then centuries. And so once those barriers get put in place, breaking those barriers down are incredibly difficult. And that's why I think this sort of race around what are the rules on the digital environment, we both need to do it before there is a war, even though there may be economic and, and, and national interests that are different, but we also need to do it before the series of new localization and other barriers get in place that would start making digital like agriculture, because once those are in place, to try mm -hmm. to break down those barriers will be extraordinarily difficult.
it might be a little too early to talk about frameworks, but when you look ahead at digital governance, data governance, what kind of framework do you think would work best? And who should lead it? Who should lead the effort to create these things? Um, so I, I, look, I think that, I think that the, um, I, I think where we're seeing the leadership, uh, whether it is the ideal place or not, is I think we're seeing it around trade agreements. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the first most tangible efforts are being made. And so I think that kind of first mover advantage is likely to be there even as we look at things. And I know the last panel talked about the possible WTO agreement on e-commerce, uh, all of which I think is laudable, um, although I think, I think the concept of that is actually too small, but it may be actually too big for even the WTO to bite <laughs> off. So I think they're gonna be these regional trade agreements are gonna be the first place to do it. Yeah. Secondly, I think that they will have to be hammered out by traditional regulators. So supervisory authorities um, will have to grapple with how they get access to the data they need from financial institutions, for example, who are not in their home country when they need it for their supervisory authority. Health systems will need to figure out how do they get access to the data they need when there's an epidemic or something. So, so there, the, the traditional institutions will have to adapt to, in a data-centric, cloud-centric world, how can they get the data to they need to do, do their jobs. Certainly what I've seen is that some of those institutions are the most resistant to see mm -hmm. the way in which we're moving into a digital environment because quite frankly, they don't know how they do their jobs without access to physical books and records. But we need to realize that there are opportunities beyond it. So I think the traditional institutions will have a role to play, but they'll have to adapt. Uh, and then finally, I think there's a, you know, I'm a big believer in APEC, for example. And you know, one of the things we were just talking about were the APEC cross-border privacy rules. And this is a guide that my firm, we created on just sort of the APEC cross-border privacy rules in kind of layman's language. How do you get outside of technicians who are data privacy specialists and explain why this matters? You know, APEC's a perfect example. It's 21 economies that range from large to small, very different legal systems, very different legal traditions, very different rules or no rules on privacy, but their goal is how, in the particular area of privacy, how do you protect privacy, how do you ensure greater economic growth and, and, and integration, and how do you do, um, how do you allow innovation to occur, but still respecting different legal systems and traditions. And so I think that's actually what the world has to grapple with. It is fallacy to think that any one view of the world is going to be the default that the world has. What you have to find are these networks of economies who will share goals but allow different ways of doing that. So I do want to touch on interoperability and I also want to give you a chance to ask questions. But I just can't resist. Who in other countries supports this kind of thing? Is it the banks? Is it the multinationals? Is it the car companies? I mean, we, we've seen previous episodes, one of the best factors for shaping government positions has been their own companies. So when yes. you look around the world, who is it you see as the, where does the demand signal come from? Well, I'll, I'll start because <laughs> I just mentioned the APAC cross-border privacy rules. There, I think you get the demand being driven by, by three things. Um, one, is a recognition that as data has growing value, and we, everybody in this room certainly understands it, that you need to have some rules for how you transfer that valuable information. Secondly, I think there are important concepts around privacy, and even though the US doesn't have a single privacy law, we have constitutional provisions that um, ensure that we protect privacy. Um, in the EU, it's viewed as a fundamental human right. I think there's a growing sense that personal privacy needs to be protected. Uh, so I think there's a general sense that that needs to be done. And finally, I think you see global businesses who believe that you need systems where it's not a single law or rule that can work in every country because that would not be possible. Uh, 
because of different legal traditions, but who want to see that interoperability. And finally, the I guess the one person that in group that I would like to think somebody speaks for um, are small and emerging businesses. Um, and one of the things I will, you know, I love the Apex CBPRs. Um, we all know, I think, the, the many attributes of the GDPR. None of those were written with small and medium enterprises at the heart of the discussions. And so, for example, ASEAN approved at the end of last year their leaders to create a digital framework for ASEAN, for the 10 nations of ASEAN. They have some pretty stark differences between the size of their economies from a Cambodia to you know, even a Singapore as a, as a nation state. They, can, they recognize around their four pillars around digital, one of which is data transfers, that they cannot have a single rule. And indeed, I think they will take the view, and I don't disagree with it, that it shouldn't be just co copy and paste the Apex CBPRs. Because quite frankly, even they in their concept, while they're high standards, they weren't written with SMEs in mind. And so I think an organizing principle for the ASEANs will probably be how do you protect privacy, how do you do cross-border tra data transfers, but I hope they'll say, and how do we become the first group of nations in history who started by thinking of our small and medium enterprises rather than what I dare say virtually everyone else has done, which is looked at it more from a top-down approach. I think at the end of the day, you should have systems that will be interoperable, and that, that is what we will need. But the interoperability can and should mean a high standard, but it doesn't mean identical. I think with the Singaporeans driving a lot of what's going on in ASEAN, they certainly are in a, a good place to make progress. But you've said interoperability a couple of times. Do you mean regular, uh, blue, regular regulatory interoperability or what? What does interoperability mean? I think it's, 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 um, it's sufficient flexibility that you can have different regimes. I mean, I think, again, I, Japan's a good example. They both are, in the area of privacy, are working with the EU and will have adequacy, but they're also champions as leaders in APEC around the APEC cross-border privacy rules. I mean, ultimately, there is, I'm looking at my European friends here, I mean, there is also um, the intent that these things should be compatible and work together. There's some gaps that have to be identified, resolved, but, but it's, you know, countries of different sizes, different legal traditions, different ambitions are going to create different standards. And that's why back to the trade agreements and the CPTPP, we had vast differences in the CPTPP economies, but we also were able to agree on a baseline around the digital two dozen, which is now in the USMCA, the digital 26 or 27. None of those, all of those are high standards, but they don't require the rules to be identified, you know, to be, um, identical. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what we need to recognize, mm -hmm. but those are clearly a higher standard than any rules that exist today in the area of digital commerce, including in the area of how governments ideal, deal across different regions with issues around consumer privacy. Let's see if there's any questions out there. Can you hold your hand up and identify yourself if there are? No, we've stunned you into silence. Well, that's discouraging. Oh, I'm sorry, we had one here. I'm sorry, please go ahead. Hi, Brett Fortin with Inside US Trade. Um, you had mentioned briefly uh, the, the WTO, um, uh, what I believe to be a reference to the e-commerce um, plurilateral initiative. Do you think it's possible to get a high standards um, deal in Geneva if China is uh, a part of those talks? Well, I know that question and came up earlier, and as I recall, I think you may have asked uh, Susan Del Bene that question <laughs> as well. Um, look, that, that decision was made that China is part of those talks, and I'm not in government, so it's really, 
not my province to second guess decisions that have been made. Uh, but what I do think it says, and I think this sort of fits into a lot of things in the WTO at this point, you know, they, that agreement is unlikely to be of the high standards that are part of the CPTPP, and it's unlikely to match the high standards, certainly, of the USMCA. So that agreement, while I think it's important for the WTO to speak to digital issues, I applaud the ambition, uh, and I encourage, I hope that works well. I do not think that that agreement would end up becoming the highest standard that's out there, because quite frankly, we don't have any recent history of the WTO taking on issues that are challenging to create the highest standards, and in part because you've got quite stark differences between a Chinese approach to data sovereignty and an Australian approach to data, and those have to be bridged. And they're unlikely to be bridged in that area. What it is also is it's the e-commerce agreement. And I've heard some companies talk about the fact that they think the nomenclature actually suggests a lower level of ambition than would be ideal. And in fact, if you look at the difference between the CPTPP and the USMCA, it, we called it e-commerce in the CPTPP. It's now talked about as digital trade in the USMCA. Uh, and so I'd like it to be as ambitious as possible. I think it's important for the WTO's relevance in the digital era, but there are some very big practical gaps um, on how access to information is viewed, or how issues of personal privacy are viewed. Uh, and I think we all recognize those gaps are not going to be closed in the WTO e-commerce agreement. Um, I think the standards could be raised, but it's gonna be left to things like the CPTPP and the USMCA and other agreements to have even higher standards that again set the basis for what the WTO can do. We've talked a couple times uh, about competing approaches. And when I look at them, you know, I wonder what can you tell us, can you describe what these competing approaches are? And maybe you can add to it a little bit of context. The word we haven't used here enough is data localization and sovereignty. Because when I look at countries, they aren't demanding data localization for no reason. They have, they have re reasonable concerns about sovereignty. So out of the different approaches sort of balance that, what, do you, what would you suggest is a good way forward? Sure. Um, you know, th this, this is the risk that <laughs> data becomes the new agriculture because you see all these protections that are put in place. Uh, one of the things that we launched when I was at USTR and that's continued is, um, with, with fantastic career folks who were working on these even before I got there, were issues around barriers to digital trade. Um, they're actually called out in the national trade estimate. One of the biggest barriers is around forced localization. And the default that initially starts with regulators who say, well, I need the information held in my country. Um, there are also a lot of people, a lot of economies who believe data centers are a source of their own economic growth. You know, in reality, all of us who know data centers, they don't hire a lot of people. There's some construction costs, but they're not big sources of revenue. Um, I think there are, so I think these localization barriers um, are many times disguised barriers to trade. Other times they're overt barriers to trade. And other times they're just that the institutions haven't yet created the mechanisms to get legitimate data that's needed for legitimate purposes. And so this, I think, gets back to this broader digital governance. So I don't think you can deal with fighting the localization barriers until, I mean, I think you can, you can make progress by explaining why forced localization is only rarely the preferred choice and that is mostly something that is going to raise your costs for domestic consumers, that's gonna har harm the great sort of value of, of a cloud-centric, data-centric world. Uh, 
But I think you've got to fill in the gaps around how do governments for their legitimate purposes, whether they are national security or protecting privacy or supervising financial institutions, how do they get the data they need when they need it? But the default, which is either localization barriers or discouraging new means of using data is not the answer because there I think you find more barriers. You know, for example, one of the big challenges we had in the, as we concluded TPP that's now been addressed successfully in the USMCA was how do financial institutions allow their data to cross borders but allow regulators to get access to the data when they need it. And mm -hmm. we concluded TPP without having, certainly I believe, without having a satisfactory answer to that. There was a lot of work done after TPP was concluded to try to get regulators together to say we need to create the protocols. And in fact, all of the TPP 12 countries agreed to that informally, but that's now been included as part of the USMCA. And so that was a great example where financial regulators, very much in the United States, didn't know how to deal with how did they fulfill their supervisory responsibilities in the case of a monetary crisis or of a failing of an institution where they would need to step in. And so their default became, we're just going to, we're not gonna allow this data to cross borders because we US regulators don't know how to get access to the data when we need it. Now, that was a bad result. I think it started from a good objective, which is how does government get the data they need to do their jobs? But ultimately, we began a path, and we're not nearly complete on that, to find a better way to say, develop the protocols you need so that you can get access to the data when you need it, but it doesn't have to be held in your country. And that's a way that these issues in a trade agreement, through informal side letters, through getting regulators at the table, and then talking about a data-driven world that we're able to come together. And I think when we talk about data governance, to me it encompasses all of that because it is e-commerce, it's privacy, it's security, it's confidence in systems, and clearly you can't have confidence in data-driven systems unless your governments can get what they need to do their jobs, but how do you create ways that that's faster and smoother and that recognizes the opportunities ahead that probably then gets back to why I think things like digital, like health and health data are so incredibly inspiring because then that allows governments not just to do their day-to-day -day work, but it improves the lives of their citizens. And so it sounds like I'm a big champion of this. I am, <laughs> I am. And it's, uh, it's interesting to contrast that with the uh, travails of the Cloud Act, which is still slogging its way towards its first agreement, despite the fact that many of us thought it would work at least a year ago. We have time for one more question. I have one, if none of you do. So, yes, this is your big chance. Okay, Robert, so what would you tell multinationals, both U.S. and foreign, what would you tell them to think about in the next year? Where should they engage? What do you want them to do? Uh, multinationals um, first should, should take some leadership. And that means leadership not just for why do data, does data matter for their companies, but what are the frameworks and what are the systems that are being created. Secondly, I think multinationals have to do more things to also engender trust. Mm -hmm. And they have to do that not just at the risk of what does that mean for um, the value of their stock if they have a breach or something goes wrong, but I think they need to realize that they need independently and in group as collective companies to be helping think through some of these rules. And I think increasingly, I mean, one of the nice things that I think I've heard over the past year is a lot of these companies not simply going to the default of saying, don't regulate. I think we've all kind of learned that actually there's some regulations that are appropriate and we need some. 
question is what are those regulations? And I think they need to be part of the discussions on those uh, that are happening. And finally, um, they have to lift up the cause of smaller enterprises. Um, you know, I work in a law firm. I'm sure every law firm in the US and the EU has been doing quite well because of the GDPR. You know, it's probably the Lawyers Full Employment Act for the rest of history. And, and you know, and companies need to comply with it. Um, but big multinationals can figure out how to do that. Smaller enterprises who are just starting can't, and it's not so much a con comment about the GDPR, it's just the more complex the regimes and regulations are, the harder it is for small and medium enterprises. So I think big multinationals have to think ahead of like how do we help lift up our partners. I think they need to do that so that we get out of the sense of you only have big globalized companies and you have everybody else. And finally, I think there are things like the CPTPP where they included chapters around small and medium enterprises to say we have to have trade agreements that work not just for the biggest players, but for all the players. And I think we have to find ways to do that, but still go for high standards. So that's, that's what I would encourage multinationals to do. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tall order, but I think the world has also changed, and I think they see many of them. I can't speak for multinationals why they need to do it, but they also see governments like Japan and others sort of leading the way of these discussions. Well, you can see who's the real master of the subject up here. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank Please you. join me in thanking Ambassador Hollywood. Thank you. Thanks, Yasser. That was fun. Yeah.